I just love the way the word cacao sounds. That's why I emphasize it. There's no extra meaning there. There's no, like, I'm not trying to make a joke. It just cacao. Caca! It sounds great. Weird, buddy. You're weird. Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new Brain Blaze. This episode is all about uh, food. That's not what it says on the tin. Normally I'm, I'm pretending I'm reading the title here, but I scrolled down already and I don't want to scroll back up to the top, so I'm just guessing at what the title was. It's the, uh, this is just the quality YouTubing that you come to me for, right? I'm such a professional. Welcome to 2023, my first episode of the new year. I'm getting over a cold. I'm drinking an extraordinary amount of coffee. I'm tired. For some reason I didn't sleep very well last night. Again, like quality YouTubing, right? And I've got, I'm going to record like three of these things. I'm so desperate vibe because I was like, I don't want to do it. I just feel sick. And it requires so much energy and the cocaine's not even working. Oh, sh Oh, cock. Oh, I'm just in so much trouble. YouTube has introduced this new thing, whereas the, if the language gets a little bit spicy, just, just a tiny bit of too much spice in the first few minutes or whatever, then they're like demonetized, age restricted. So uh, from now on, Sam, all of those, don't bleep them out. Just, um, Introduce like a different sound. Like, I don't know, not a bleep because they know about bleeps. Not like just silence because they know about just silence. Just introduce like a sound, I don't know, like a crow going off or something like this. Like, ha! Ah! Is that a crow? Is that what crows do? Look, this isn't important. We're here to read Danny's words and enjoy them. So let's jump in. Toad in the hole. It's quite strange that I really question the name of this popular British dick back. British dick? Popular British dick. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Piers Morgan. <laughs> Dish, Simon. Dish, are you trying to get demonetized? Good lord. There's certainly no toad, and even the hole is debatable. The US have their own version of toad in the hole, which is simply an egg dropped into a big hole on a slice of toast, which is then grilled or fried. What you do in America? That's not a toad in the hole. <laughs> you idiots. A toad in the hole is sausage in batter, and we all know it. Don't make us take your country back. We can. We can't. We can't. You're much more powerful. <laughs> the size of your navy is extraordinary. <laughs> you would crush us. The British version is more of a mouthful. These days, the dish consists of a few sausages baked inside Yorkshire pudding batter and served with vegetables and lashings of gravy. It's a cheap and cheerful comfort food. But I never really got a sense of anything, toad or otherwise, being inside a hole. Well, it's kind of like if you slid the sausage out of the hole. This is getting very erotic. And uh, there'd be a hole remaining in. That's where I always thought the name came from, but I don't know, no one ever does that. You just eat it as a whole thing. I never ate these very much. I never ate Yorkshire puddings very much, even though my nan was from Yorkshire, just because I don't think my parents like them very much, and I honestly don't like them very much. Like, I'd rather have roast potatoes or parsnips or, God forbid, Brussels sprouts, which I actually enjoy. In my experience, the sausage was more kind of nestled inside the crispy batter. A toad buried alive might have been a slightly better description had we ever been talking about a toad, which, of course, oh, we're not. It seems that the whole, uh, excuse me, was invented long before the toad or the sausage came along. The origins of the dish date back to the 18th century when it was originally described as meat boiled in a crust. Mmm, delicious. Where have for lunch today? Meat boiled in a crust. So a pie? No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't get any, don't get any. They said, we're not that fancy. It's meat in a crust. Yeah! Burying cheap meat in batter was seen as a way of stretching out meals in poorer households, and one early appearance of the recipe appeared in 1861, written by Queen Victoria's cook, which went under the tantalizing title of a pain cookery book for the working classes. <laughs> Queen Victoria's like, <laughs> cook right to food. She's like, this is all the shit I don't eat, peasants. Ah, ha, ha, I'm too rich. I'm just eating peacocks. And your children. <laughs> the name of the dish would accurately reflect the choice of meat in those very early days. So those deprived working classes would be feasting themselves silly on pigeon in a hole, lamb's kidney in the hole, and offal in the hole. Mmm. <laughs> God, being poor. Being poor sucks. Being poor in the past, so much worse. But by the time we reach the end of the 19th century, we appear to have settled on the sausage, albeit a sausage, riding under the sneaky pseudonym of a toad. There's a convoluted story which attempts to explain the reason for the strangely unappetizing name. Long ago, a golf tournament was held in the town of Almuth in Northumberland on a course which was apparently overrun by Natter Jack Toads. People always are like, Simon, like, I know I've never heard of Natterneth or whatever the <coughs> f it was. I, I, I've never been there, probably will never, I don't even think I've been to Northumbria, to be honest. And people are always like, Simon, how can you, like Americans or like people 
that are not from the UK. They're like, how do you not know how to pronounce that town or that in the in the UK? Even I know how to pronounce that. I'm like, you don't know. How would you know how to pronounce all the rounds of it? Have you seen English? It's a fucking nightmare. It's like, how do you pronounce that? Oh yeah, Colonel. How the what the fuck is going on with Colonel? Why? As the star player triumphantly putted his ball into the 18th hole, he was dismayed to see it pop right back up again. The ball had been ejected by a grumpy toad who had been rudely disturbed from a nap in the bottom of the cup. The chefs at the local hotel were also amused by this story that they named a new dish for the golfers that evening, which was supposed to represent the angry toad poking its head out of the golf hole. That's hold. That sounds enormously apocryphal and just like a nonsense story that came around later and someone wrote it in Reader's Digest or something in a letter. That's almost certainly a load of old bollocks, though. It could be that some versions of the dish just look a bit like the head of a toad peering out of its burrow as it patiently waits for a harvest mouse supper to scuttle into view. Or it could be connected to the mysterious entombed animal phenomenon of the late 18th century, in which mummified remains of many small animals, including toads, were found encased in hollow stones with a tiny opening at one end. That's fucking creepy. Why would you do that? <laughs> hollow out a stone, put an alimony in there, and just wait for it to die? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing, people, in the past? I don't want to sound like I'm a future serial killer, but it's fun. <laughs> Is this what entertainment was before we had PlayStations and shit? Because I mean, goddamn, RSPCA gonna be pissed. RSPCA is like, um, I don't know, it's like the protection of animals. Royal Society for the Protection of Animals. I'm not sure what that is in America. It's not PETA, because they're like in they're, they're like fully insane. It's it's more just like, you know, just making sure people don't bully their animals, which is nice. It's a great organization. Or it could just be that someone reckons that the sausage in the hole sounded a bit too rude and subsequently decided to introduce a rogue amphibian into the batter mix. I still think they should have stuck with boiled meat in a crust until a stronger alternative hopped along. Funny, bada bum bum dum. Head cheese. Okay. I like to think of myself as something of a cheese board connoisseur. Craft slices, laughing cows, cheese triangles, squirty cheese in a can. I've tried them all. Oh, Danny, no. I was just about to say, oh, Danny, you gonna make some cheese recommendations. I, I, I discovered Gruyere. This is such a ridiculous conversation. I discovered this cheese called Gruyere. It's fucking great. There's no other cheese like it. And if you haven't had it, you should try it. Omelette de fromage? Oh, Dexter, Dexter, omelette de So I'd naturally be very interested in sampling what North Americans like to call head cheese, but I might end up feeling a bit disappointed when I discover that head cheese contains zero dairy products at all. I have no idea what this is. I've absolutely never heard of this before. I'd assume it was some sort of cheese. But it's obviously not. And I might even be more disappointed when I realize that I've been served with a jellied and compressed loaf which is made from the boiled head of a pig simmered in seasoned stock. What the f is going on? At least the head bit is accurate. I'm just not sure that a vegetarian would be convinced by the cheese part, particularly if they happen to glance into the dead pig's eye sockets during the cooking process. No eyes or ears or brains are found in head cheese, though these organs are removed before the remainder of the head is boiled and stuffed with savory jelly. Wait, including the f***ing skull. What happens to that skull? That's so weird. <laughs> There's a skull in there, right? But you should get a nice bit of tongue and cheek if you're lucky. I mean, Danny's being sarcastic there, but I love like beef cheeks, like um, slow cooked beef cheeks, red wine sauce. It's fantastic. And uh, beef tongue, also love it. I, I don't know, I've never had pig tongue, but I assume it's also good. I went to a restaurant not so long ago where the starter was deep fried pig's ears. And I was like, okay. Okay, and it was delicious. I mean, because it was deep fried and like salted the shit out of, but it was so good. It was like fatty and my mouth is watering for that right now, which I realize people who haven't had it is slightly weird and also any vegetarians watching. I'm not particularly concerned about them. To be honest, the finished result looks something that I'd have serious doubts over serving to my dog, but apparently head cheese is something of an acquired taste. <laughs> it's just a taste I don't want to acquire. Some things you're like, yeah, it's an acquired taste. Okay, I'm totally cool not acquiring said taste. Thank you very much. The dish dates back to the Middle Ages of Europe, and most of us in the UK would now call this dish brawn. We would? I've never heard of this. I didn't even... <laughs> okay. Uh, the Scottish go with potted hide, but why does North America insist on bringing invisible cheese onto the menu? Well, it's got nothing to do with actual dairy cheese. It's got more to do with an alternative usage of the word cheese, which stretches back to the 18th century and essentially meant molded or formed. It describes the process of forming ingredients, say most of a dead pig's head, into a loaf, pressing it and chilling it until it becomes solid. I'm assuming, Danny, at some point they've removed the skull from their head in some sort of weird de-sculling procedure, because otherwise it's going to be very unpleasantly crunchy.
So in this case, the dish was called a cheesed head, which eventually evolved into head cheese over the years. The name has stuck, even though most diners today are probably unfamiliar with this old art of cheesing that has nothing to do with cows or milk or squirty cans. Apparently, it's very difficult to get a hold of good head cheese in the US anyway. It's a proper pain in the trotter to make it at home, and most of the stuff you find labeled as head cheese in supermarkets is actually just lumps of pork shoulder encased in meat jelly. <laughs> Why would anyone be like, you know what, we can't get good anymore? Head cheese, the the cooked skull. So we come up with a fake version of that. No one wants that. <laughs> who is eating? Who is buying this? Let me. If you're buying this and enjoying it in the comments, let me know. There's probably no one down there. I really wouldn't try too hard to find the real deal. Use your loaf on this one and stick with the craft slices. Greek yogurt. One of the biggest success stories of the last decade or so is the remarkable use of Greek yogurt. Greek yogurt's weird. Isn't it? It's bad for you, and it doesn't taste very good. Why wouldn't I just eat regular yogurt like a normal person? Not in Greece, obviously. They don't even really know what Greek yogurt is. But the hipsters of the US and Europe have recently embraced the benefits of Greek yogurt, which is very similar to normal yogurt, except it's been strained several times to get rid of most of the liquid whey and lactose, resulting in a thicker consistency and a healthier snack, packed with more protein and less fat. Okay, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Apparently, Greek uh, Greek yogurt is healthier. I was always kind of like, it's all thick and it tastes bad. I just... just I don't know where I thought it was worse for you then. Okay, well, at least there's that. It's still not very good. You don't know what you're talking about, do you? Back in 2007, this newfangled Greek yogurt only accounted for 1% of the US yogurt market. Today, it accounts for more than half of the market. Oh my god. The people are obsessed with the health craze because there's no way people are like, yeah, it's better. It's better. Yeah, once you've added like chocolate and honey, maple syrup, and blended it all together, and then it's like 90% sugar anyway. You're not really eating Greek yogurt anymore, are you? Jokes on you, I'm into that shit! That's probably because many of us have grown to believe Greece was the original home of proper yogurt, and everything else that's come along since then has been a bastardization of the original natural concept. Just a few quick points, though. The Greeks probably didn't invent yogurt, strained or otherwise. The concept of strained yogurt is not even particularly Greek. No Greek company or state has ever held any pattern to Greek yogurt, and you'd probably be surprised if you ever sampled strained Greek yogurt in Greece. Known locally as Stragisto. I don't know what I'm doing in Italian accent. I went to Greece last year, and I, I cut it. You know, sometimes you're like, you know, I think it's mostly because there's the stereotypical accents and then that's what you do. I don't, I, I can't do Greece. I don't know what they sound like. I know their writing's crazy. It's like, it looks like, you know, it's not the, the Cyrillic alphabet. It's not Roman. It's got all these weird, crazy ass symbols in there. <laughs> like a circle with a line drawn through. You're like, okay. <laughs> All right, then. As it tends to be very plain and it's not stuffed with all the fruit flavors and sugar and additives and crap that you'd find in a European or US version of Greek yogurt, yogurt itself is unlikely to have Greek origins. It was probably first whipped up in around 5000 BC by the Neolithic people of Central Asia and Mesopotamia. The strained variety has been around for centuries, but again, its origins are not directly linked with Greece, as it was most likely developed independently at around the same time in Middle Eastern and Central Asian countries and is today enjoyed around the world without bearing any support supposed claims to Greek roots. The Greeks are themselves probably baffled as to why Europe and the US seem to be under the impression that strained yogurt is so thoroughly Greek. And would you believe it? The answer lies in nothing more than a devious marketing strategy. Oh my god, what? That's shocking news. It's just bullshit marketing from a corporation? That's why it's called Greek? How could you lie to us, companies? We've been so honest with you this whole time. And you betray us. When the Turkish billionaire Hamdi Ulukaya first launched his Chobani brand of strained yogurt in the US in 2007. It was marketed as Greek yogurt. This was partly inspired by the Phage brand of Greek yogurt, which had been selling well in the States for a few years already. But the difference is that Phage are a Greek company who produced their yogurt in Greece. Oh my god, they take the yogurt from Greece and bring it to America? Oh my god. <laughs> Is this kind of shit, I'm always like, this must be devastatingly bad for the environment. Like, when you buy, like, Florida orange juice, you're just like, oh my god, can't we just get something made in Spain? <laughs> Florida's so far away. <laughs> oh my god. And it's, like, not from concentrates, and they're just shipping juice with water in it across the oceans. And you're like, oh my god. Society, what have we done? <laughs> and somehow it's such, it's relatively cheap. You're like, ow. <laughs> Oh my god.
In contrast, Tabani is a US company founded by a Turkish businessman who was getting his Greek yogurt produced in New York. At least it's better for the environment. And it was Chobani that went on to become the biggest selling brand of supposedly Greek yogurt in the US. Hamdi Ulukair has argued that he is simply labeling his products in a way that customers will understand, even if the product description has no meaningful relevance to the product. Fabe wasn't very happy, though. They've taken legal action against Chobani in the US and the UK in an attempt to stop using this alleged false labeling. The Greek yogurt war between the two companies continue to rumble on today, although Fabe has had no luck so far in the United States, where Chobani can still market their product as Greek yogurt. It's a different story in the UK, where the courts ruled in 2014 that Chobani's marketing amounted to deception. Whilst Fabe can still tout their products in the UK as authentic Greek yogurt, Chobani now has to make do with strained yogurt, which is uh, markedly less appealing, but also good for the UK. You're on top of this one. I know in the US they're like, because those, they, like in the Europe we have all these rules, like champagne has to come from champagne champagne and in the u.s they're just like that's champagne hey it's from california it's not champagne champagne comes from the champagne region of france come on get it together it's misleading <laughs> you can't get champagne for two dollars a bottle Come on. But I suspect that the consumer base for healthier yogurt is naturally going to feel more inclined to go with the brand that sounds more exotic and fancy and authentic, even if it's truthfully none of those things. Big Joe's all-American bacterial fermentation of milk is not likely to fly off the shelves anytime soon, but Giorgio's authentic Greek yogurt. Well, I have a crate of that funky sh**, even if it's produced in an industrial estate in Wolverhampton. <laughs> Very nice. Cape Cod Turkey. A very quick nod to the cod of Cape Cod, which sells itself as turkey, but it's actually just cod. That's deeply odd. Oh, I see, Danny. <laughs> You're flexing your poetry muscles right there. There's certainly something very fishy going on when you order the local specialty Cape Cod turkey in the titular peninsula in Massachusetts. What you'll actually get served with is salted cod, salt pork, potatoes, eggs, and a creamy sauce. Not sure that appeals to me. Like salted stuff and like, you know, I don't know, I'd probably enjoy it. The creamy sauce mixed with it sounds a bit weird though. That that with like the salty stuff sounds like it'll get all curdly and a bit rough. It sounds nice enough, or does it, Danny? <laughs> but the turkey is noticeable by its absence. So how did this dish ever grow wings? Well, it's probably because Cape Cod has always been famous for its fishing industry, and the early New England settlers were rolling around in more cod than they could ever eat. They had to gobble it all up pretty quickly too in the days before refrigeration. In contrast, turkeys were often trickier to hunt down or afford in the olden days. It's believed that some of those early settlers couldn't get hold of traditional turkey to celebrate Thanksgiving, so they had to make do with cod again, but under a playful new name to disguise these salty tears of disappointment. <laughs> no one's gonna be like, oh wow, this turkey tastes really like cod, but it must be turkey. Oh, just choking on a fish bone. Like, what's going on? It's also funny, like, cod's much more expensive than turkey these days, right? Turkey's like cheap. Cod's, uh, th at least I think that's how it is. I don't really know. I don't really eat much cod, to be honest. Lies. Oh, lies! <laughs> The story may be a load of old cods wallop, and I'm curious to know what you ask for in Cape Cod if you actually want turkey. I still think they chose the daft name because Cape Cod Cod sounds even more ridiculous. White chocolate. Oh, I know this one. White chocolate is not actually chocolate. I don't think it contains any cacao. I never really had a taste for white chocolate, and I could happily have pushed the Milky Bar kid in front of a horse. Oh, I, I quite like milk chocolate. It's a bit weird, I know, because it doesn't have chocolate in it, but I like it. I haven't seen him around much lately, but ever since 1961, the little blonde-haired cowboy with circular gold wire spectacles has been the face of Nestle's Milky Bar on TV commercials as he battles his Wild West opponents with wit and cunning before triumphantly declaring, Milky Bars are on me! <laughs> I remember this from being a kid. The UK version of the commercial often used the accompanying slogan, that's the goodness that's in Milky Bar, before it reluctantly evolved into that's the good taste of Milky Bar, on the grounds that of course there's no goodness in Milky Bar, it's not a bloody banana. Is that true? I swear I remember Milky Bars are on me. I feel that we did have that. Milky Bars are on, otherwise how would I know how to say it? Is that how he says it? Maybe I'm just like false memorying this. Or when I hit the age of around 13 and I had been transferred to the roughest school in Britain. Holy <laughs> shit, really? <laughs> Danny, that's intense. That's probably rough. I briefly went through a phase of wearing circular gold wire spectacles. My family had told me that they made me look like John Lennon, which I thought was quite a cool look at the time. Yeah, if you want to look like a bell end. Unfortunately, <laughs> sorry, I don't like John Lennon. Unfortunately, the ruffians at my new school had clearly never heard of John Lennon. So for the next six months, I was branded the Milky Bar Kid. I was hounded on a daily basis to deliver the slogan, Milky Bars are on me. To a I shouldn't be laughing at this. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, milky bars are on me, so I avoid getting punched in my circular gold wire spectacles. Maybe that's why I really don't care for milky bars or white chocolate in general these days, as I can't deal with the traumatic flashbacks. Or maybe it's just because I find white chocolate to be sickly sweet, and I'm not sure how it can be legally branded as chocolate. It's a contentious topic, though. When Swiss company Nestle developed their first major commercial white chocolate in 1937, it was apparently an attempt to do something useful with all the leftover milk powder following the end of the First World War. God, you're so disgusting. That's not white chocolate. I know, well, you know. See, I'm one of the, I know this is a boring tangent that no one cares about, but like my parents, whenever I go stay with them or whatever, they're like, oh, do you want a little bit of chocolate? I'm like, no! Because they'll whip out some like 80% cacao shit. And I'm like, this isn't chocolate. I mean, I know it's technically chocolate, but it's also like, why would I enjoy this tiny, thin, bitter monstrosity? It, t it doesn't taste good at all. How can you enjoy this? Daddy, chill. And I would be like much more like inclined to just, I want the sickly sweet milk chocolate, which is weird because I'm normally not like a sweet person. Like I'll always go for the savory snacks. Oh my God, Simon, no one cares. Just get on with the bloody script. I was like, new resolution 2023. Stop telling people things they don't care about because no one cares. Woo, let's carry on. Now the customers were able to go back to buying fresh milk again, this left tons of unwanted milk powder supplies to shift, leading their state to develop the Milky Bar, or the Gallic Bar, as it's known in continental Europe and Latin America. I live in continental Europe. I've never seen a Gallic Bar. I've never actually seen a Milky Bar. Maybe they're just not very popular. North America got their own version from Nestle in 1948 under the name of Alpine White, although this was eventually discontinued in the 1990s, probably because the North American market realized that white chocolate might as well just be pigeon shit wrapped in tin foil. But why call it chocolate in the first place? Real chocolate is traditionally defined as containing cacao solids. After the cacao bean has been... I just love the way the word cacao sounds. That's why I emphasize it. There's no extra meaning there. There's no, like, I'm not trying to make a joke. It's just cacao. Caca! It sounds great. Weird, buddy. You're weird. After the cacao bean has been removed from the pod and mucked about with, you're left with the nib, which can be separated into cacao solids containing all the flavor of true chocolate and cacao butter, which is essentially just the fat, which helps to deliver the rich texture. So far, so yummy. But the problem with so-called white chocolate is that it doesn't use any of the flavorsome cacao solids. It just sticks instead with the cacao butter. Wait, is this cocoa butter? When did we switch from cacao to cocoa? I realize I'm reading it wrong. Was there a cacao seed and then a cocoa butter? Oh my god, why is it, why is this so complicated? Are they the same word? I don't even know. Am I going to look it up? No. No, I'm not going to go back and record this whole thing again. Are you insane? I got shit to do. And just sticks instead with the cocoa butter. This tastes foul on its own, so it's mixed with milk, solids, milk fat, vanilla flavoring, and sugar to make the whole concept more bearable. Yeah, white chocolate sounds horrible, but somehow it's good, Danny. I don't know what to tell you. But it still feels a bit like cracking open an egg, discarding the yolk, and sprinkling crap all over the yet egg white. White chocolate doesn't fall under the FDA's legal definition of milk chocolate, which must contain at least 10% cocoa mass made up of equal parts cocoa solids and cocoa butter. But it did get an FDA definition of its own in 2004, which states that white chocolate must contain at least 20% cocoa butter. The FDA was pressured into coming up with a new definition in response to complaints from Hershey's Foods and the Chocolate Manufacturers Association of America that some companies were marketing white chocolate, which contained only vegetable oils or cheese fat instead of proper cocoa butter. The complaint seemed to be based on the idea that it's unscrupulous to market a fake version of fake chocolate. Not everyone agrees that white chocolate is little more than an enduring white light. Some respected food experts reckon that the inclusion of cocoa butter alone is enough to justify the name, as it all comes from the same bean. But I would still consider it to be chocolate confectionery rather than pure chocolate. And that's where we end today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Smash that like button! Yes! Well, it's kind of like if you slid the sausage out of the hole, this is getting very erotic, and uh, there'd be a hole 